Hello, I'm Tim McHenry. At the Rubin Museum of Art, we have the privilege of sharing ideas and art from the Himalayas with the world. The function of this very particular art form is to guide us on how we can explore our inner world to help us better navigate the outer one. In this on-stage brainwave program, filmed on October the 21st, 2022, we looked at what the concept of pride and the sense of self means. How our afflictive emotions, or klesha in Sanskrit, can get in the way of seeing the interconnectedness of the world clearly. The Vairochana Mandala teachings aim to assist us in recognizing how to translate the disruptive and competitive energies generated by feelings of pride into the wisdom of equality. A recognition that difficulties arise when we try and place ourselves on a higher or even place ourselves on a lower level than others. Yale University's Dr. Philip Corlett studies our sense of self. As a cognitive neuroscientist, one of his areas of study is the cognitive and biological mechanisms of delusional beliefs, such as there is a self, as well as predictive learning, habit formation, and addiction. He is meeting for the first time Jean Grey, who over the last 25 years has been known as a rapper, producer, composer, singer, humorist, author, actor, director, editor, designer, puppeteer, and minister of her own church. She calls herself a multi-potentialite, but that in itself can cause confusion for which aspect of the many faces of Jean Grey is an audience going to get. Sometimes I don't know which reputation precedes me mm -hmm. in a room. And, I'm, and people are not really sure what they're, what they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of performances I have, and someone's like, well, I, where was the insult thing here? And they're like, I came to see your rap, but it was all comedy. I came to see your comedy, and instead you just gave a PowerPoint presentation on cats. <laughs> But was it good? Um, so I think that's always an interesting thing, and I, I think it was interesting to start off with talking about delusion. Mm -hmm. I don't sure. know how. Um, what's your TikTok presence? My TikTok <laughs> yes. presence? So I don't have one. Um, mm -hmm. I have a Twitter presence, and we've sort of interacted yeah. a little bit there. Um, the university actually asked me to start a TikTok account because of my semi-successful Twitter, but I haven't done it yet. Um, and I'm not so sure about building that particular brand or whether I should let Yale, you know, creep in on my sense of self and identity. It's kind of a strange thing that we do, right? I, I do all of this, these experiments to try and figure out the nature of what it is to have a self and what it means when that fades away or disappears. Um, and in a sense, I'm kind of enacting that by putting this work out into the world and encouraging people to engage with it. And it's sort of it's often difficult to know where, you know, myself as a scientist ends and other aspects of me kind of begin, like being a dad or a husband or those sorts of things. Do you think that there's a point where, where, that, where that stops? Like it's, not, it's not completely just a, a full thought, because I think a lot of us struggle with being like, where is, where is that side of me that's work? And then where is the side of me that I'm just home? And I'm like, but what if we just thought of the whole... Right. thing, like why do we always try to draw lines in well, between those things? So protection? I think it might be, yeah, and I think the pandemic has really thrown this into deep relief, right? We're at home, we're working at home, we sort of crawl from our beds to our desks and hop on Zoom and, you know, we didn't really travel very far or get out into the world as much as we might have liked. And I think it really is important to draw those sorts of boundaries and to try as much as possible to be present with whatever thing that we're doing currently and, and to not let those things bleed into one another, despite the fact that I like to identify myself as a scientist mm -hmm. and that I try and approach things in a sort of scientific way regardless, um, I do think it's important to be um, one thing with one person at a time if possible. That would be nice. I've never experienced that in my life. Sometimes, sometimes I wish for that. I think it's, it's always, you know, the times where people are like, oh, you're so lucky. You get to, you know, you don't work for anyone. You create. I was like, no, that, that's the terrible part. So much of me, so many times has been like, I just, what, can I just go to a job that starts at a certain time 
and then someone tells me what to do, and then I do that thing. Right. And then the job is over, and then I go home, and then I'm just me. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. Yeah. Because in any of the careers that I've chosen, it, it, they never end. Mm -hmm. There's no weekends, there's no holidays, there's, I work from home. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting during the pandemic, quarantine lockdown, because I don't like saying, you know, during the pandemic, we're still in it. <laughs> That's why you're all wearing the mask. Um, that uh, people were like, I'm finally getting a chance to like explore hobbies and be at home and do things. And I was like, great, this is it. This is the great fucking awakening. Mm -hmm. And then everyone will see we don't have to fucking do this anymore. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, I was at home. I just, I was about to start a puppet show that uh, finally, I, it had taken years to sell. And they were like, all right, we're going into production in March of 2020. And I was like, no. <laughs> and then they were like, can you shoot it from home? Mm -hmm. And I was like, how much money? <laughs> <laughs> And so my lockdown and my quarantine, you know, as, as, as a person who normally works for long, mm -hmm. when, when you are creating an entire world, like you're working on a show like that, it's like world building. Um, so building all of the puppets and the, our house became the set. So, the desire to draw the line between this is my job and this is where I live and then you're trapped at home. Mm -hmm. And when I started looking for therapists, I was like, so the issue, and they're like, can you take a vacation? I was like, no. And they're like, how about don't work from home? I was like, yeah. And it was like, is there a person to speak to that I can talk about living on the set of my own puppet show? <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that you mentioned is, is world building, and I think that's really relevant to the topic tonight, right? One of the things I study is how we build our sense of self, and situations where that might break down. I've tried to study it from various different points of view, people who unfortunately get brain damage and, and lose aspects of their sense of self. Uh, they might believe that they're dead. Um, even though they're still walking around, it's called the Cotard delusion. I did not know that had a name. No. I don't know if anyone else suffered through that in the past couple of years, but there were definitely moments after we were both just in the house, just being alone, where I would wander in the room and be like, do you think maybe we died at some point and now we're ghosts haunting our own house? Super interesting. Yeah. And I think that arises because um, you know, in, in my lesion case, right, in my patients who've had a stroke, who've suffered brain damage, they start to have these feelings in their body of depersonalization that are so severe that the only thing that makes them make sense is that they've passed mm -hmm. away or that parts of their body have, have rotted away. And it really speaks to that kind of constructive process that our, our brains do, that really the self is a story that you tell yourself and others in order to make all of these things that are incident upon us, all of these attachments that we have, make sense. Um, and it's so malleable, mm -hmm. which is which is really interesting and can be really productive and enlightening, but it can also be super scary. And so I, what I think my work points to is this sort of Goldilocks situation wherein you don't want to have too strong of a sense of self and brand and narrative because it kind of gets in your way and makes you act obnoxiously. But on the other hand, no self completely can be utterly terrifying and, and totally unmooring. Um, I don't know if you've gone into sort of deep meditative retreats, I'm sure many of you in the audience have, but often that can be something that happens to people. It's not something we talk about a great deal, but um, being socially isolated, mm -hmm. being perceptually isolated, as we've all sort of lived through over the past three years, can really mess with the way that our brains set up predictions about our world. You know, it's trying really hard to impose those old stories, those old narratives on new data, 
Um, and whenever there's a mismatch, it can be really uncomfortable and kind of uncanny. Is going through that sort of thing what kind of what we what we've all been through? And I think, yeah, thank you for saying like the the inability to create these new stories, to go to new places, mm -hmm. to build things you know, socially with new people. Is that in itself like? I, f I, I mean, I definitely feel like we should all be talking about the fact that we have got some serious PTSD and mm -hmm. we're not discussing it, we're just moving on like everything is good. Yeah. So what kind of form of like damage to self and to the brain is going through this whole process? Well, it's undoubtedly been stressful and stress hormones really impair our brains. Well, thank you for saying that. That's why I have one today. <laughs> 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 well, like I said, everything in moderation, <laughs> including moderation, right? Cheers. Yeah. Uh, cheers. Um, yeah, so that sort of stress response, um, particularly around the kind of unpredictability and the uncertainty, right? When this whole thing started, we were told, oh, two weeks and it will be done. We can just be right back at it. And here we are, three years later, still not completely back, but really wanting to be and, and almost demanding it and kind of falling back into those old routines that, like you said, it, it would have really been nice to kind of shake us out of a rut a little bit and, and kind of reset and restart. I, I, I get sad a lot um, just, just during the day, just thinking about it and kind of seeing everybody like go on about their day and be like, hey, you know, it was so nice even though I was working and I was like, well, now I'm just watching everyone do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I keep telling people, it's like, learn a new skill. It's like, do something else. Like, there's a way out of this. We can do it. And then capitalism was like, oh, no. Right. They got to get the fuck back to work. Right. No, we're not destroying this system. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think about everybody finally having the time because that's what this system sucks out of us, is having the time to think about yourself, mm -hmm. the, the time to be, to create pride and, and thoughts and memories and something else outside of it just being in survival mode. Because, I, you know, like you, I, I like to explore lots of different disciplines, and I worry sometimes that I sort of fall between two stools and never end up satisfying anybody. Uh, apart from maybe myself. Anybody or yourself is going to be my <laughs> right. question. Which, right. is, which is more disappointing for you? Uh, letting myself down is, is way more disappointing. How hard are you? Oh, very hard. Um, yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible right now in my head. Right. You feel like we're doing terribly? No. I didn't want to wear these shoes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are pretty good. It's like, yeah, I think that being so hard on, on yourself, even when everyone is what business it is, mm -hmm. and like you're just in your head, just screaming at yourself all the time, and you're presenting like, it's, it's great. Right. Um, I know uh, in, some t in some professions that I do, it's welcome. Mm -hmm. It's fine in comedy. Right. Uh, it's almost it's, expected. It's, right? it's almost expected. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the self-deprecation of it all. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's probably why I gravitated to that. I, I tend to be a tad bit dark. Mm -hmm. um, and, but in something like rap, mm -hmm. you definitely have to portray a certain. Well, that's the interesting thing. I now identify as non binary. Okay. Um, during my rap career, I uh, identified as a woman, or as they would call me, a female. Which let's just stop. We're not at the zoo. Um, it is a competitive world. It is based on braggadocia, mm -hmm. based on I'm the best. And I thoroughly enjoyed that about it. And I never looked at it like I'm enjoying myself here on this stage or on this song. My mission was to destroy. It was to destroy the imaginary people. Mm -hmm. It was to destroy the other people who were on the song. Mm -hmm. I if someone was like, you're opening for them, I was like, they are closing for me. I'm terrified now. <laughs> <laughs> but as a woman, mm -hmm. 
That was not accepted. And I'm like, well, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It was always um, that I should be grateful to be there. And I think just as an other in general, uh, as a, 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 a black woman, a mixed woman, an immigrant, I was raised Muslim. I'm like, listen, I got all the fucking others down. It's like, how, how, at what point do I have to stop being like, I'm so, oh, thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And because I never presented that, and my only presentation was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm better than you. Um, it was never accepted. Mm -hmm. It did not go well. How did you get past it? I stopped rapping. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you miss it? I, I miss, um, I miss it as a challenge for mm -hmm. competitive me. I, I love words, I love writing, I love, I love all of that. Mm -hmm. But there, at a certain point for me, I was like, I've done this for 25 years. It's, it's a long time, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. just to get in there. And I'm gonna, I'm, I'm hurting myself. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, if you're like, if, you're n if, if I'm never gonna get anything other than um, men are the bar, and she held her up, and I'm like, you know I destroyed them, let's not do this. Mm -hmm. um, or I should be grateful to be here. Or I, I'm never gonna be in the same category. Rap is one thing, female rap is another mm -hmm. thing. So, it, it was, you know, I, I can go be masterful in many other things. Mm -hmm. It's okay to let it go. Okay. So it's interesting, so, I've approached science kind of similarly, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Um, there was this feeling, this sort of apocryphal story that perhaps people tell you when you first go into prison, that you're supposed to find the biggest guy in the yard mm -hmm. and hit him as hard as you can to prove yep. that you're something and that you have something to say. And I've often tried to chase the big ideas or the new territories or the things that people thought were outside of the realm of science or something that we ought not to have something to say about. Um, and, and I've tried that, and, and it does become exhausting. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to try and sort of stake out new territory and pursue new things, and it's really exciting. But at some point, you know, you've kind of got to stop innovating, <laughs> you know, and hand over the torch to other people. And I think that's the point where I'm at now where my job isn't to push me as the brand forward anymore, it's to train the next generation of people who are coming through and, and sort of point them to the areas where I perhaps went wrong or slipped up or made the wrong choices. Um, I'm still very proud of what I've done, um, but in a sense I'm also kind of over it and don't want to be known as the guy who does that so much anymore. How, how many like rough times did you have in those thoughts? Like, I know it, it really in my heart. I was like, I know it's not me. I know I'm amazing. But at a certain point, you're like, okay. what, what if I'm not amazing? Yeah. yeah. And then that leaks over into so many other mm -hmm. things. Yeah. No, I definitely, you know, submitted grant after grant application every time. You know, three times a year every time they're coming back, not even discussed. Like, we're not even gonna dignify this with comments. Jeez. You know? And, uh, and it wears you down. It is, yeah. It really it's does. Uh, and it really it eats into your sense of self. And so, so my response was, let's try and do the craziest thing that no one expects, and pull it off, and show that I'm a sort of force to be reckoned with or someone to be taken Same. seriously. Uh, and for me, that was working with people who believe that they're psychic. I'm so, I'm so, y'all can believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so interested in that. I, th I think it's such an interesting topic. And I, I love um, watching uh, mediums and psychics and being like, I can't tell. Mm -hmm. Who's, um, what is his name? Tyler? The young, the oh, young yeah. guy where he, he draws. Mm -hmm. he does the cold readings of people. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so I'm less interested in that side of things. I'm more interested in people who believe that they're clairaudient. So they hear voices in their heads and they're from spirit and they're sending messages to be passed on and shared with whomever they think is the willing and worthy recipient of this information. And so I use that as a sort of control or comparison condition for people with schizophrenia who hear voices yeah. in their heads. I was about to say, where's, where's, the, so, where's the line there? So that's what we're trying to find out, right? And so, you know, if you can be someone who believes that they're psychic and hears voices exactly with the same frequency, mm -hmm. they're saying the same sorts of things, they're as often as intrusive and kind of mean as the voices here. So what's the difference? And, and how can we kind of combine these two groups to learn you know, a bit more about ourselves in general, but also how can we help the people who kind of suffer and, and find these things to be distressing? Plenty of people told me not to do it. They said people are gonna think that you think that you're a parapsychologist, that you're trying to prove that these things are real. Uh, when we published the paper eventually uh, in science, uh, lots of people called up from the press, Yale proved psychics are, tr are real, and all those kind of things. You know, we had to sort of dampen down mm -hmm. those sorts of ideas. But, but what that did, that, is that sort of swinging for, for, for the fences really gave me the freedom to kind of say, you know, these ideas are actually worthwhile and worth pursuing. Um, and people started to take it more seriously since then. So, so since then, all my grants get funded. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of them. Oh, you know, no. <laughs> more than more than none. So. I think yeah, the idea of it's same, and being like, also being like, hey, if you're not going to let me in the club, like, at a, okay, I'll stop trying to get in the club. Like, I'll go down the street and then I'll, I'll build a whole new club. And definitely, yeah. you can't come in. Like, right. no. Um, but the idea that, and I think that happened to me very early on, um, probably before I got my first tattoo, mm -hmm. where just living in the world and being like, the rules don't apply. So if the rules don't apply to me, and I'm invisible, and you don't want me here, so then what does it fucking matter? Mm -hmm. So then I can do whatever the fuck I want, right? right. Um, and yeah, even, even in that sense, my first my first tattoo was very small. My second tattoo was this giant dragon on my back. And I was about 19 years old. And everyone was like, what are you doing? And I was like, don't worry. I understand the world is going to catch up. I live in a non-linear. I'm in the future. Just don't worry. <laughs> um, and you were right. Yeah. That, like, what kind of job are you going to get? I'm like... What are you talking about? <laughs> I make the jobs. Mm -hmm. I will always make the jobs. Mm -hmm. But I think when, especially um, being someone who doesn't like to be in boxes and who likes to innovate all the time and who likes to think of these big ideas, after you get shut out mm -hmm. and turned down, you're like, anything. Mm -hmm. We can do anything. Mm -hmm. Is, is that where you're at right now? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I never like to be told that the approach that we're taking in the lab or the questions that we're trying to ask are off the table for me. Um, I know that some people like to have, you know, within a university, say they like to have their different departments. Like, so our morality is for mm -hmm. divin the divinity school and philosophy. Why can't it be for science and neuroscience, right? I mean, it all happens through the brain. Somehow, yeah. um, I'm not saying it's all caused there, or, or not, I'm not taking a necessarily a reductionist stance, but the data that we gather might have interesting things to say about those sort of higher, you know, broader questions about humanity. Um, and I, I never like to be told no. That's usually a sign to, to go do on it and more. Do yeah. 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 yeah I, I don't know why they kept doing that. Do you not see at this point? <laughs> like, the more the more you say no, the more I want to do it. I was going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that uh, that you know the idea of of pride and uh, people, especially now, I think it's it's become like a, a term to say. Um, like Gen Z, and I find it super, super troubling that um, like someone needs to be humble. Mm. Like 
humble them. I feel like that's a very hard idea to get across to people. What? In a sciencey way, what prevents everyone? Um, I also run a, a, a non denominational church called Church of the Infinite, but the slogan of it is Save Yourselves. I'm, I'm not here to save everyone, I'm just going to mind what you're all supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm always telling people, like, it's not about me being a superhero or me being up here. The idea is for all of us to be superheroes. Mm-hmm. All of us to have that confidence. So. And it doesn't mean anyone has to be low. Mm-hmm. How do we stop people from thinking that this has to happen instead of this happening? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I don't know a sciencey way necessarily, although I'll try, but the first thing I'm going to say is just some amazing advice that my PhD advisor gave me, um, which is that you're running your own race, right? You never have to outrun anybody else, and comparisons are always going to sort of trip you up. And you don't know the race that anyone else is running. You think you do, but you really don't. And we see this in economics and neuroeconomics, right? Like, money doesn't create happiness. Well, it does to a certain point, right? (laughs) But then when you reach that point, there's always someone above you who has a little bit more, and then it just keeps going. I mean, so whilst it is our way of being in the world to draw comparisons with people around us, that's the thing that that trips us up and and gets us in, in trouble often. It can be motivating, right? Yes. And, and I think you can use that energy in a really positive way, um, but it can also become sort of all-consuming. And I don't know the secret. Um, when I find out, I should probably start my own church. <laughs> you are welcome to join forces. And I'll be like, no, it's all real. See, he's a scientist. And I'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, I think a lot of it is just tied to two, I mean, two things, white supremacy and capitalism. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, once we cut those out of the way, yeah. <laughs> um, that we truly just be able to look at uh, ourselves. And, and, you know, yeah, the, the comparisons don't have to be intrusive thoughts. They don't have to be, they're doing something great, but that makes me shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, again, to get back to that point I was making earlier, it's really important not to pull the ladder up after you, but actually to make sure that whoever's coming up next learns from your mistakes, takes the path that maybe you didn't and really benefits from it. And I think that's a really hard lesson mm-hmm. to learn because it doesn't feel right. Like if you had to struggle to get where you are, it I was think, weird to help others, but I think it, it actually helps more in the long run. I was uh, looking at something uh, as I, in the past few years, um, finally like just I've been I'd calling myself a polymath for mm-hmm. a little bit, but uh, the better Might term... Be so. Okay. <laughs> uh, I felt like the better term was multi-potentialite. Mm-hmm. And the idea of being that and that... Uh, it's in making... The joy is in making all of these things. Right. But sort of just because that's what I got. Mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily for me. And I think the idea of describing it like a lab is so beautiful. But mine isn't like one ladder. Mm-hmm. It's it's like being surrounded by ladders. Mm-hmm. But there's platforms above me and then there's more ladders and I'm like, yeah, fucking let's go, let's go, let's go. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it also serves me in a way that it provides dopamine and, and serotonin and it makes me happy. Mm-hmm. To see other people be like, yeah, I am that motherfucker, yeah, I can do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, go do a thing that I, I probably didn't think of. And now. See, see dopamine's a really pernicious thing. Yeah. Right? It, it wears so many different hats. This is the chemical in your brain that gets released when good things happen, but also when bad things happen, when things happen that you don't expect. Mm-hmm. It's also the thing that drives you to act and really motivates you. So in, in so many senses, it's good, 
but too much, just a little bit too much at the wrong time, and you can start hearing voices, yes. believing strange things. Um, and it's so weird to me that this really basic brain system that's there in like rats and mice and monkeys seems to obey the same principles, and yet humans are the ones who are sort of afflicted with this, these sort of very strange consequences when it gets slightly out of whack, and it doesn't take very much at yeah. all. I'm, I'm a person who's, who's very, uh, I, I have some issues with my dopamine, but I also know that my brother, who is schizophrenic, mm -hmm. and I'm like, it's a terrible joke, but I was like, I was like, oh, I guess you got like more of the dopamine because you were first, mm -hmm. and it sucks for you. Um, and so I always wonder, I'm like, if I, if I'm, I feel like I do all of these things like just to kind of ride the point, mm -hmm. and then no one to pull back. Mm -hmm. But I do understand that there could be a level where it goes past that. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you? Sure. A science question. Please. Okay. That's what I'm here for. All right. Um, dopamine. Mm -hmm. uh, Related to doing uh, things like heroin, or more importantly, cocaine, mm -hmm. or uppers and stimulants, mm -hmm. what is the, how do those things work together? And then, and then I'll tell you. Sure. So, uh, so your brain is made up of neurons, and they talk to each other at these little junctions called synapses, right? So this is one cell, this is another cell, and this side has tons of these little bubbles that are full of dopamine. And when the cell is active, it spills its dopamine out onto the other side, the cell on the other side. What drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine do is make you release more of that and also make whatever's released stick around for a lot longer. Question, caffeine as well? Uh, not, not so not much. Strong. Yeah, not so much. That actually has its own set of receptors. Um, kind of induces a similar sort of jittery feeling, but not to the same extent. Um, and so, feels good, right, to have lots of dopamine until it doesn't, right? Until you can't get rid of it, until you can't process it away. Uh, until you need to get more of whatever it was that caused you to release that much in the first place. Um, and so, there becomes a sort of vicious cycle um, one of the reasons I really got interested in, in paranoia was, was through listening to a description of this guy who'd taken a lot of methamphetamine and made himself paranoid, right? So he was like, I, mean, I was in my apartment and smoked a bunch of meth. I thought that the superintendent was watching me, and so I smoked a bit more meth. <laughs> and then I went Fantastic down, response. And then I went down and asked him, and he said no, but I kind of saw this glint in his eye, and I wasn't really sure if he was like, a robot. The, meth. the glint was So the I meth. smoked a bit more meth. And so this guy just, uh, it, this is on a okay. podcast. It's a fantastic story if you get the chance to, to listen to it. He ends up running down the street, hiding in a liquor store, like back room. Was it a bit math? more math, right? Yeah. And so, so I'm really interested in that interface between addiction, um, the actions that cause dopamine to get released, and then this manifestation of sort of psychosis and fear. Like, how does something go from being very blissful, exciting, and mm -hmm. sort of an overly confident experience almost into something that's really quite frightening and un unnerving and kind of ineffable? Um, and it, and it does seem to be around this kind of multiple hat role that this one or two molecules play. Are there uh, people who generally have low, low dopamine levels and doing those kinds of uh, things like a meth or a cocaine, they don't really have any effect? So there are definitely individual differences. Um, People who are at risk of psychosis and, and schizophrenia definitely have more ready to be released. Whether or not they have different reuptake and processing capacities, we're not entirely sure, but the images that we can take tell us that they have more ready in that presynaptic neuron ready to get spilled out. Um, whether or not people who are prone to addiction actually have less or less of a capacity to kind of bind it on the other side and so you need more bang for your buck 
and it starts that vicious cycle a little bit more quickly. Um, we think that might be true. So people who have a family history of alcoholism, for example, are less likely to bind lots of dopamine at the post synaptic site. We do all of this with what's called PET imaging, which is um, a, a, a way of introducing radioactivity into your brain very briefly with dopamine, and you look at where it binds and how much those neurons glow, and you can get an individual by individual kind of measure. I, um, I, I was a heavy drinker at some point. I was a professional champion. Uh, I've, uh, we're people I've seen later on in life be like, remember the time you drank us under the table? Like, there was a very high table, mm -hmm. and we got drunk, and you were still up there. Um, but as you get older, I, you know. Your tolerance that, drops. My sure. Your tolerance yeah. drops. What is the bigger picture? How do we tie all these things? How do we stack the passions? How do we make everything work? Because otherwise, it's just scattered and everything. And that feels OK when you're a little bit younger. And then at a certain point, you're like, I need to fuck a streamline. Because I, come on, we got a lot of things to do. And also, this is exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, my general through line, uh, and I didn't like I knew it and, and someone was like someone made the comment to me that they were like you're the labyrinth of your brain is really interesting and I'm like truly it's just really one mission and in anything I make or in anything I do I was like it's, it's a, a, two, a little bit of a two-parter there's um, especially in film or TV or, or writing any any of those things, that the my idea is that I have to see the void, um, the spaces that are empty, and the people that are clearly exist because I am one of them, and I have never been represented. I don't see myself. I don't see myself anywhere. But I know a lot of me. There are many of us. So my job is to break boundaries by doing that with anything I do. And the second one is, in general, um, to make people extremely uncomfortable in order to become comfortable. Yeah, I, that's an amazing answer. Um, and, and to sort of steal it a little bit, I think there are two through lines in my work. One is kind of creative destruction. So how do we take the things that we think that we know and disprove them or challenge them or push against them? And then at the same time, how can we approach consilience? So William Huell was a, a mathematician at Trinity College in Cambridge. He invented a lot of words. Um, first was scientist, before they were called men of science, so he allowed women to be scientists. <laughs> and the other word is consilience, which is the unity of knowledge. How do we bring things from disparate disciplines and like types of inquiry and see how they fit together, right? When you think about things like mental illness, we always hear about like the biopsychosocial approach, as if each of one of those things is like separate and independent. I'm really interested in how when you push on one, how do the other things change? How do they lean on one another? And that's what I try and pursue.